Carlos, the first question, comment I have for your postdoc is, did you ask him to play the lottery? Did I what? Did you ask him to play the lottery? Did I ask him to play <laughs> the lottery? You know, that kid is so extraordinarily bright. He had done his PhD in this area, but what he does now is actually grape breeding. Um, our, the, his actual postdoc project was to develop a genetic map of grape that, uh, you know, was successful for this was featured in the New York Times, for those of you who are interested in them. Yes, I'm not quite sure who came first, but... Yes, yeah. What first question here? She was actually first, but... Excuse me? She was first. Who? Uh, yeah, <laughs> she, she came before me. Oh, okay. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, thank you. This is just, I'm, I'm blown because now I'm thinking, what about then climate and all the sort of discussions that had gone on to the early sort of adaptation to climate, which is associated with, you know, pigmentation, um, malaria, all of these things. Can you then kind of make that connection or disconnection? So I could change some of the way I've been saying this when I sort of just say, oh, if you study genetics, you'll find this. If you study geography, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody, you want to take, I can take three. Go ahead. So, I mean, I, I, it's, it's interesting that, you know, I, I would say if there's any dogma out there, it's that vitamin D and folate are linked to skin pigmentation. But in fact, it still remains this area that we don't fully have the entire picture figured out, and uh, I sit on the board of PLOS, and we get many different hypotheses of, you know, trying to link the causal relationship. I think in this particular case, it, you know, it's one of those that um, there is an impact on skin pigmentation as well of this allele, so. No, but, but, but we also know that they, that uh, at least in human skin pigmentation, that this has, there has been selection, and climate Absolutely. and radiation has been a very, very important part of it. But, I don't think one should look at any one of these as monocausal. Uh, you know, we are the results of forces that have gone on for a long period of time, and presumably multiple, multiple ways of getting there. Okay, next question. Hi, my, uh, my question's for the entire panel. Um, there's so much enthusiasm for people to go search for their roots, their genetic roots, because I think as in the last um, panel presentation, it helps them with their identity formation and with being part of a I guess shared identity, whether it's from Africa or with some trying to trace their family lineage. Um, and there's also evidence that this genetic stuff can be um, influential with health disparities yeah. research because I guess some, as um, the pre presentations mentioned, there's inc increased variation and people with a certain, certain genetic expression respond differently to a certain treatment compared to another population. Um, but my question is, how are you going to get some of these same populations to have the same enthusiasm for the clinical research needed? Um, and specifically with the clinical research that a lot of you have done, how did you get so many people of um, so many minorities to be to um, do the clinical research that you have done? And how can you continue that fire for all the other clinical research that's yet to be done? That was easy, and I'm very proud of that because the NIH has been moaning and groaning that we don't get minorities in clinical trials, and you go to the good old boy networks that have all the clinical trials, and they're all uh, non-minority phys physicians, and they can't tap into it. And you know, I was a young uh, punk that came by in 1998, and I, being Hispanic myself, having grown up in a Hispanic neighborhood, I just knew how to go get all the Hispanics on my side. And I just got off my butt <laughs> and I went to minority serving clinics. And you know, lo and behold, we now have 9,000 kids. It's the largest pediatric study in the United States of asthma. And the NIH just invested $60 million in the study called Soul. And uh, they got 16,000 Hispanics. But with my little study of $6 million, we got 7,000. So. Um, we're doing this. We're doing this in the minority community. And the key thing, I think, was to have good connections. We had um, minority uh, recruiters. We had minority physicians. I made millions of community presentations. We got community buy-in. We had the National Medical Association involved, which is the largest and oldest black physicians group in the United States. They backed us. They're backing us now. Um, it just makes common sense. It was, a, it was easy for me. Yeah. I'd just like to add a little bit to that. Uh, from my own experience in, in, in doing studies in, in the U.S. and outside of the U.S., 
I think it's important, uh, the message we convey to people. So one of the ways I say, you know, I said, if you want your clothes to fit you, you have to show up at the tailor so you get measured. <laughs> if you don't get measured, you know, you're going to rely on other measurements uh, and you, you hope that those clothes will fit you. That is precisely what uh, Carlos and others on the panel have showed, that there are certain genetic variations that are specific to populations, and if we, those populations don't show up, guess what? Those clothes will not fit. Yeah. I have to be mind we have to be mindful of Tuskegee and other atrocities. Exactly. Um, and the Native American groups haven't participated, but the fact is the genetic train has left the station, and there have been a million benefits that have derived from the Human Genome Project. Unfortunately, they're going to be applicable to just a few populations. And it is a civil right, in my view, to participate in clinical trials and an obligation to participate in clinical trials so that all of us benefit from the fruits of the Human Genome Project. So um, I'm going to give you a somewhat more general answer. Um, so um, over the last week, um, you know, there's been a major report published on the status of U.S. health. Um, I don't want to get political, although there's nothing you can say in this town and not be political, so, so <laughs> here goes. Um, so I think the bottom line, despite whoever comes from any political persuasion, is that uh, the U.S., among 14 other peer nations, um, we have the worst health and we spend the most money. So whatever the wisdom is of whatever we are doing, it just doesn't work. And there are many reasons. Health disparities are a very big part of it. Uh, it appears that uh, we all ingest too many calories. There's too much violence, uh, meaning firearm-induced violence in the home and outside. And all of you should report, uh, read this report. It's a sobering sort of view, having nothing to do with being a geneticist, or everything to do with being a geneticist, yeah. or being a health expert. I think an Amer every American needs to read this report. So I agree with just what Esteban just says. I think it's an obligation for us to uh, hold all of our politicians accountable in the sense of, and for us to, but, but it means we need to participate. On the genetics equation, I think, I have a broader view. I don't know what's going to happen. I wish I knew. If I wish, if I could wish the answer, uh, then I think I could design the studies in a much more simpler way. I, I really think I don't know. Genetics might be, in many cases, and in some cases, like the example you saw in PCSK9, is probably the easiest way for us to intervene and find a drug that could affect, in that particular case, are, you know, lowering the effects of the worst LDL, of the worst cholesterol, and reducing heart attacks. But in many other cases, it might not be the most effective way. There are other things we could do. We could vaccinate every child in this country. Yes. And that could prevent other kinds of illnesses. So I'm not a genetic exceptionalist. Mm -hmm. What I do is very near and dear to me. Uh, but I think we need to fit genetics into the larger health equation. And in that, our ancestry will play a very strong role, be it on the gene side, be it on the environment social side. And, and I said that what I'm going to say is going to be political because I think our healthcare system has to embrace both. There's no other way of, we can't just hide our, you know, ignorance by saying it's only social factors yeah. or it's only genetic factors. We also got to have community, academic community partnerships because as you know, the number one cause of death in young black men is violence. And there are ways that we can get around it. We just started an academic community partnership at San Francisco General and UCSF to um, implement uh, wrestling programs in elementary schools, which are, will allow kids to get out their aggression, to have positive thinking, and, and we just, uh, that's something that is near and dear to my heart. It's not genetics, doesn't get me funding, but it actually is an important contribution to public health. I think we'll take two, just two more questions. Yeah, we have and, the, last and the last two people, and people. if we can keep it short, we'll move forward. Uh, please. Well, it depends on their answer, how long it takes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've discussed um, genetics and health of Hispanics. Now, as far as I know, there's no genetic predilection for speaking Spanish. 
So what do you mean by Hispanic? And why, what is it that you really are looking for? What do you think the word Hispanic is standing in for? What is it you are actually studying? So because of the first slide I showed you about the significant differences in the rates, prevalence rates of asthma uh, in the United States, highest in Puerto Ricans, highest in African Americans, lowest in Mexicans, when I was a young medical trainee in 1997, I was very inspired by that. And uh, I made it my life's career goal to study that. So we only recruited individuals that self-identified themselves and their grandparents as being 100% Puerto Rican or 100% Mexican or other Latinos. Now, that is actually a beautiful population because, uh, and I didn't show the data, but they're a, a tri-hybrid mix of Native American, European, and African. Now, we could look at it from the purely genetic factor and adjust for those racial differences and, and get down. Chris G. New, who's uh, my graduate student here, just identified a gene, uh, a novel gene for asthma that tended to be, um, uh, had significant ancestry differences, African versus Native American versus European. I am mindful, and I tried to make that clear, that this identity, the social identity of being Puerto Rican or uh, Mexican or African American is like a shopping cart of other social experiences. So like African Americans, it's not just about African ancestry, it's the social experience of uh, perceived discrimination, which might lead to increased stress, which might lead to increased blood pressure, which increases your risk for kidney disease and heart disease. So we tried to be very comprehensive, and that's, that's when I started that large study, the Gala and Sage study. We, we measured all those factors. Charles here is a big proponent of looking at the, the whole picture, um, and uh, I think I came to that first, and then you joined me, or? Um, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, no, I'm but. I'm going to answer that crazy <laughs> No, no, no. no. From an epidemiologic point of view, we try to look at the whole picture, not just are you Hispanic. There's genetic and social and environmental factors. Okay. okay. Last question. Uh, yes. Th this has to do with uh, what's happening now and moving forward in terms of uh, training. Uh, mm -hmm. The whole idea of who's coming through medical yeah. schools, who's coming through public health schools and universities. How do you see this information changing the way because it is slippery and it's moving, and it's, it's, it's messy in some ways because it's not just the science and it's not just the genetics, but mm -hmm. it's also culture. How do you see this affecting the training of people whose job it will be to do this work in the next generation? We, I, I think it's super, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, I think it's fundamental. And um, one of the issues that, you know, so I run one of our uh, T32 training grants at Stanford, and I'm also, you know, involved with some of the NIH decision making around uh, training grants. And you know, it is very—it's a very in fact, that's a very political issue, right? The NIH is now rethinking. Uh, different institutes are rethinking where they're going to invest. There is the sequester. There's a reduction in NIH funding. Training is unfortunately one of the areas that will also be impacted. And I don't think there's an, an easy answer except to say that if we do not train both a diverse workforce and a workforce that can think about these problems, we are going to be in a tremendous amount of trouble, right? You know, our, the proportion of GDP that gets spent on healthcare is just yeah. going up and up, and it really is unsustainable, so. So, you know, in 1813, uh, all, the number of black physicians in the United States was 4%. 2013 is 4%. We're doing a terrible job terrible job and and unfortunately y'all you guys are funding it and so we need to put political pressure not only on medical schools uh, not only on the NIH but we also have to work we have to address the pipeline issue it begins in grammar school begins in kindergarten and and we need those the head start programs to to keep going so let me just add just one more thing. I, I, there's actually no doubt that we live in a much more complicated world, even a complicated academic world, let alone the world outside. And, and uh, 
I think there are three parts. The science is important, I agree with you, but I think our students are much more savvy and much more exposed to, to the societal aspects of at least the information. Um, and, uh, and the third part, which I think is really a part that's missing on much of the non-medical science or non-medical graduates is we teach human biology only to physicians anymore. We do not teach it to others. And, and I think this mixture of teaching human biology, the much more detailed molecular science, by the way, that also includes quantitative thinking, as well as understanding how the information is relevant to the world outside. Um, I think it's a new concept. It is changing, but change comes slowly. Even in Hopkins, we have a new curriculum that's called From Genes to Society. It's taken some time to get there. Some have said that changing curricula is like moving a graveyard. It's, it's not easily done, and, and, but, but I, think, um, I think we are, you know, that's a very, very important, important part. We are not so separated from our subjects or universal communities as we used to be. And I also want to say so two things. Number one is that, you know, one of the agencies that is particularly under fire is unfortunately the National Science Foundation. I think the National Science Foundation does extraordinary work. They are, the, really the only agency that's taking on uh, K-12 to training in STEM areas. I can say that the only reason I'm in science is because I was part of a National Science Foundation program when I was in high school, right? If not, I was you know, going to be a lawyer. And, um, and also, it, I, cannot men I cannot fail to mention that I was an intern in this building. And so, you know, I think the uh, Smithsonian and other institutions have an important role to play as well. And I think, you know, all STEM areas are important. All STEM areas are great. We should just be pushing and pushing and pushing and saying, look, you cannot cut in those areas. It's just, it really is about U.S. competitiveness. Every dollar that gets spent in STEM uh, uh, training is returned multifold, right? I mean, it's just absolutely crazy to not continue to invest. So thank you with very that much. Note, we're going to have to come to an end to this session, and I want to thank the panel. And, and we're going to move directly into our next um, panel on arts and culture and ancestry, and we will not be taking a break after that panel. We will move into the last panel uh, and complete our day. Um, so we will move the tables now and have a very different conversation. Uh, with our moderator, uh, Dr. Cole, the uh, director of the African Art Museum.